Hi guys, welcome to my shop. I'm Robin, and uh, first of all, thank you to all new subscribers and old subscribers. Uh, just a lot of uh, subscriber activity. Um, getting ready to bump up close to 5,000 already. Um, that's pretty exciting. Like I said before, not my motivation, but um, it sure is encouraging. So uh, another detail is, uh, you notice a lot of voiceover in uh, my videos and um, that's not necessarily by choice it's more of necessity my son and I both work here in the shop and um, we have to do jobs <laughs> and make money so there's a lot of background noise there are air cleaner central air cleaner going on CNC bandsaw you name it there's just a lot of background noise and uh, initially I was trying to just stop oh hold up we're going to take a shot and that just kills production. So I said, Fooey, just need to um, take the shots, not worry about it, um, come back and voice over. It's not all that difficult. And um, in a lot of ways it's easier in the fact that you can, you can back up when you mess up uh, what, you, what you said. But uh, that's why there's a lot of voice over in the videos. So um, this uh, video is on um, some production techniques on a manual machine for some very small um, pins that I make occasionally and it's just some techniques to um, make that a worthwhile uh, situation and uh, make me competitive so uh, let's get to it okay here's our piece um, it's 0.151 diameter which I can buy a uh, drill rod um, and that's the way they have it uh, 01 drill rod tool steel drill rod it's got a 5 thousandths corner here so my plan of attack here is to do the um, technique where I actually hold the piece in the collet here. I have the full length of material out here to the right and in this case we're going to put it in a little guide tube in the tailstock and we're going to part them off uh, complete on this end. So the tool for that is going to look like this. We're going to have a parting tool shaped like this, steep angle here to um, leave very little tit on the piece that's left we come in, we face to length, but we continue past and then this chamfers this corner just by controlling the X where I stop on my digital. So that produces a piece that's two length, ready to go. This is in against the stop in the collet, or in this case we end up using a um, um, emergency collet board with a actual relief and a step in the back to carry it. So we part all of them off this way so this ends actually complete finished faced and chamfered now that they're done and um, on this overall length and everything in the chamfer same collet that we bored uh, just about 10,000 shallower than this finished length here we have a tool that we ground here which is a turning tool which we will turn this diameter uh, 125 plus nothing minus one so we turn that and then we come back we come in here and we've made this tool right here a single lip cut that will cut right here to do the drill point and clear in the back and obviously this tool has to have un relief underneath to clear because this is a conical uh, surface that we're generating so that's what that tool looked like um, the reason I'm doing it in a single tool is um, with only 400 pieces and I don't really have you know gang tooling set up getting a drill aligned in the same holder uh, you don't want a whole lot of motion uh, uh, digital wise as far as doing these manually even with a programmable digital so this gives us a very short path boom 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 and done uh, without having to do anything crazy so even though the tool is a little tricky to grind um, it's better than trying to do with something where I have a cutting tool and then a separate drill bit so that's the uh, plan of attack and here's the um, parting tool you can see the um, parting part here. This is the 45 degree section. Notice they both have a uh, top rake ground into them separately, so it's got a positive cutting angle. And uh, you can see the lapped finish here, the tops on those surfaces, so that um, that's where we get it there, our, our good finish from. Um, this is just a micrograin uh, groove tool, but even it held up and did a nice job for all 400 and 20 odd pieces so here's the turning and drill point tool the turning section is right here 
and then this is the drill point section that cuts on this lip right here only and that cuts right to the center and this is after all 440 some odd pieces and you can see the uh, the lapped finish right here at the tip um, so I can get in here I'm looking through the camera so I'm like yeah right there that is the wear flat on that piece on the on the um, face the flank and there's not really a lot of wear flat on the uh, drill point uh, just a very small one there but that's after all, all the pieces and like I said it was not resharpened it was just compensated on the uh, diameter kept giving good finish this is a C7 carbide so this is a, a high-end finishing grade of carbide so um, for steel so um, that's what that tool looked like so that's where having a piece of stainless steel tubing laying around and a piece of nylon air hose lying around that just happened to fit into each other and the stock will ride in here uh, full length and this tubes held by the tailstock chuck and sit still and all we do is slide the piece out into the collet, part it off slide it back in again you'll see that in more detail here's the emergency collet that I bored for doing these it's bored to 0.151 diameter same as the stock actually the stock might be 0.151 and a half uh, you notice there's a shoulder down there at the bottom there's actually an undercut I'm not sure if you can see it but the back is undercut uh, back there and then it's got about a hundred thousandths hole uh, in there for clearing the tip for the from when we use this for the first operation of parting off so uh, yeah that's it's a hundred and about 145 deep and the turn the amount that was left there that uh, when we did the turn the shoulder was 156 so it had just a little over ten thousandths of distance from the shoulder to the face of the collet um, these are uh, super cheap import collets I had to regrind this taper it was way off uh, so I reground those and then another thing is they're typically uh, the cheap collets are, are sprung closed such that when you take the pins out they're actually tight so you can't get your part in and out because the the collets collapsed so I just take a uh, screwdriver go in the slot expand it and then take some Viton o-ring stock and put it in the grooves and that gives enough expansion force to hold the collet so it actually stays open um, and you can get your pieces in and out when you release the collet so just a little uh, little tip there but um, this uh, I started out trying to do these with a um, regular 530 seconds collet which is 156 and it just didn't have good enough grip when we were doing the parting operation it didn't grab the part straight enough and we had some uh, places where the the um, stock wanted to actually vibrate in the in the tube uh, and just caused some issues. So I said, Phil, I'm just going to bore a, a uh, emergency collet and get it done right. And then it gives a good consistent stop for the end lengths on these. Here's the uh, boring bar that I used to bore the .151 collet and also put the relief in the back corner. There you can see the lapped top surface of the tool. This isn't an ideal tool. I mean, if you're doing these in that size bore and length in production, but I had this one ready to go. It's kind of spindly, but it's solid carbide, so it's relatively stiff. So this was able to go in and do that bore, face the bottom, and relieve it. And uh, just so I'd show you that, so you know how we got that relief in the back there, the digital. When you're doing a lot of parts, it, uh, it's a good idea to lubricate the collet using Blue Molly here, molybdenum disulfide um, extreme pressure lube for on the collet seat. Just a good idea when you've got a lot of repetitive operations, that collet's going to open and close about 800 and some times. And then uh, we're inserting the stock into the uh, liner there in our, uh, our uh, tube to carry the part. And there it is mounted in the tailstock and then here we're going to see the actual uh, inserting the stock into the uh, collet and uh, clamping it and this is the part and chamfer operation 
goes so long, the parts, the stock's actually spinning in that tube at the moment until it stops. Right now it's parted off, so it's sitting still. Back up, blow it off, put the next, uh, make sure there's no uh, flap on the end of the bar, and then grab the part, and then uh, put it back in again, up against the shoulder, and part off another one. And here it is just a little faster. Putting a new part in the emergency collet. The emergency collet has a step sh shoulder in the back and again stop internally. Coming up on our 0.125 diameter on the digital. Feed on. Running up, watching our Z indicator. Turning the feed off at the very end. Hitting it manually. Come off. Move into the zero position for the um, part of the tool that does the center or the drill point. Going into its Z position, backing off. Pillar file with uh, safe edge, just knocking the minute burr off of there, make sure there's no rings. That's it. Another part in. Repeat the process. The visual indicator on the digital is essential for uh, this working well. Uh, this obviously is a programmable uh, digital readout. This thing is uh, probably at least 30 years old, but it's still uh, um, basically state of the art of digitals. Another one complete. There she be. The diameter's plus nothing, minus a thousand. These are the ones that are parted off and chamfered. These are the ones that just got the turn diameter and the drill point. Here's the file we were using to just break the uh, burr on the edge of the uh, edge of the parts there. This is a pillar file and then I actually surface ground the edges of these to get down to just a very very uh, little break edge left on here. Just a very light stone because there's only about uh, ten thousandths of an inch of uh, stock sticking out and there does tend to be a little teeny hair ring that forms on there so just a light touch with this on the OD uh, was all that was needed to to break that off and then just a, a little rollover on the other edge just to break the sharp edge on that. We've tumbled them before but um, this is actually quicker and it's more surefire in getting rid of that ring. There's a little tip uh, that might not be apparent. Uh, these tools that I did were are lapped with uh, Dime, one micron diamonds on a, a ceramic lap. That's why they last through the entire job, all 420 pieces here. Um, same tool, no, not resharpening. Uh, have to make little minute adjustments, you know, a few tenths here and there at a time for a little bit of tool wear. But basically the tool lasts for the entire job, both the part off and the uh, turn and drill point uh, feature. Now, in the process of making these, uh, we cut the 36 inch long drill rod in half into 18 inch lengths. But we squared the end up on the belt sander so that we had a, a good reference. You can see the belt sander crosshatch marks there from spinning the rod. And then we took a, a um, sanding sponge and just knocked the edge off so we didn't have a burr there. Now, that means that more than likely there's some abrasives that are embedded in this to some degree. Uh, sure, we could go scrub them, ultrasonic wash them, all that. But what we've done is we uh, look for those, and we've taken those pieces out, and we leave them to the very end. If we didn't do that, more than likely the little bit of abrasive that is in these, as that tool cut, uh, the tool would have deteriorated from having to go through that that's that uh, portion that might have had some uh, abrasive embedded in it. So just a note that uh, if you're thinking through and and. Uh, about how to make the job run well, uh, that's a pretty important point. 
using a counting scale here to count out the actual pieces. In this case we needed 360. This is the Heidenheim PT-855. Uh, it's coming up on its 20th birthday on uh, August 26th. Uh, this is a $2,600 digital readout, just this head, back then, 20 years ago. Um, I would do it again in a heartbeat. The visual indicator that we saw earlier is just essential. This is a four axis, you can plug in as many as you want. I actually moved this thing back and forth between my mill for the last 20 years. Uh, at $2,600 a pop, um, unless you're made of money uh, and you actually need two people working at the same time, doesn't take that long to change it, you just change the settings. Uh, this is a digital readout that uses analog scales, uh, meaning that the signal from the scale is two uh, sine waves in quadrature, meaning they're, they're phased 90 degrees to each other, and the interpretation of that sine waves is done internally in this, and the subdivision of that is adjustable in here. So if I want, I can actually make this thing read 10 millionths per division on diameter in the lathe. Uh, obviously, I'm not going to do that, but I run at uh, 50 millionths on diameter, which means this thing's interpreting 25 millionths of an inch increments on the x-axis. Uh, so it's just handy to be able to set whatever resolution you want. Other uh, digitals that use um, digital scales, all it means is, is that interpretation of those two sine waves is done internally in the electronics of the head in the scale and then it just sends out incremental pulses uh, in quadrature of the position but you have no ability to subdivide and uh, get other resolutions so even though these might be more expensive in the beginning the versatility and the ability to go higher resolution um, is just very powerful so this thing's programmable you go to the program page it holds 20 programs and you come in here and you can just do tool changes. It has 99 tool offsets. Uh, so you can change tools. Uh, it remembers where they are, even if you unplug this. It's non-volatile memory. So I use uh, the offsets from one up for lathe tools. And then I use offsets from 99 down when I go over to the mill. And switch them back and forth and I don't lose position. It has homing routine. So when I come back to the lathe, if I, after I've removed this, I can just home both axes. I haven't lost any of my tool positions or uh, offsets. So you literally just program in your X, uh, Z, X, Y, Z moves. If you're on the mill, you can do bolt patterns. Anything that the digital can do, you can do with programming. Uh, and then you go to the run mode, you just tell it automatic, and it goes into that mode, and it's waiting for you to go through the actual moves, as you saw in, in uh, doing these pieces. So very powerful uh, digital. If you made it this far, thanks for watching. Uh, even if you didn't make it this far, thanks for watching. And I uh, uh, hope you found something useful in here um, or interesting or both. And um, please uh, subscribe if this content uh, is up your alley and uh, share with your friends.